have your Bibles, I'd encourage you, please, to take your Bibles and open to Acts in the 19th chapter. Acts in the 19th chapter. If you don't have a Bible, in the pew in front of you where you're sitting, there is a Bible there. Please take that Bible if you'd like. You can actually take it home if you'd like. And in that Bible in the pew in front of you, you'll find the passage of Scripture on page 1,315. 1,315 if you want to use a Bible in the pew. But I'm sure glad you're here this morning. We're going to open our Bibles because what we want to learn uh, must come from the Word of God. You didn't come here just to hear an uh, ugly man's opinion. You came here to hear from God himself. And so this morning, I'm going to take you to the Bible like we do every week here at First Baptist Church because the Bible is the Word of God. How many are glad that God gave us his Word? The Bible was not man's idea. The Bible was God's idea. And the, uh, the Bible is the very, uh, the very Word of God. Every bit of it is inspired. Every bit of it is helpful. And some of it is easier to understand than other parts. There are some parts I'll still read, and I've studied for a long time. There are many people more studied and, more, and smarter than I am. But you read some, you're like, wow, Lord, I know you've got something to say right here, but I don't know what it is. Uh, but there are some parts, and I think this passage this morning will be an easier one to understand. I pray that it will be helpful sometimes before a sermon, before I preach a sermon, someone will ask, well, do you, do you have a good one this morning, Pastor? That's a lot of pressure on a pastor. Do I have a good one this morning? Here's my stock answer. Whenever I write them, they're always good when I write them. They're not always good when they come out. They're always good because they're the Word of God. If there's any portion that's not good, it's not God's Word, I promise you right here. It's this, this vessel right here. But today I want us to hear from God. I'm going to challenge us. You see the title on your screen, the title being True Christianity. At the end of the service, as you leave this morning, the ushers will have a, a handout for you from the notes from this morning's service. It is last week as well. I heard of this idea that at the end of the service, I don't give them to you before, but at the end, you can take some notes home with you, look over them throughout the week if you wish, and look in the portions of Scripture again to hopefully find uh, the message that God has for you from here. But I want to challenge us this morning on true Christianity. Years ago, I had the opportunity to go to New York City. I've been there many times now. My wife uh, was born and lived about 45 minutes outside the city, and we went many times together uh, to the city, to Central Park, and the Bronx, and those areas. I went on senior trips, and, and so I've been to New York City by myself with others multiple times. One thing that you would find then, I've not been in a few years, but one thing you would find then is you would find people selling Rolexes for 50 bucks. Now this is amazing. Imagine to have a Rolex timepiece, to have the, 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 the height of craftsmanship in a watch, the smooth movement, the carefully crafted crystal and the, the beautiful band and, and real diamonds for $50. And what's amazing is you'd meet someone and they had a lot of them. <laughs> and to think they're willing to sell to me, just a humble tourist. Now, I've bought some of those before. Folexes, we call them. Joke Lexes, you, there are lots of names for them. And uh, I remember one time I, I got one. Now, listen, understand, I knew what I was getting. Some of you right now are like, Pastor, you're going to come up to me at the end. Of, I know how this works. You didn't hear anything else I said, but you're going to come to me at the end like, Pastor, I don't think you bought a real Rolex. <laughs> Thank you, dear sister. Thank you, dear brother. I, I, I now I'm settled in my spirit. I bought those watches, and, and uh, of course, they're just cheap gimmicks. A real Rolex will run smoothly. Those are like this. 10 seconds, 33 seconds, 4 minutes. The band marks your, turns your wrist green. The time is accurate twice a day. <laughs> They're not true. They're not genuine. Now, I imagine that if you've ever been duped and bought a fake, that you were disappointed. I have. Not a Rolex, but I bought something that I thought was real and ended up being a fake, a counterfeit. I didn't feel good on the inside. I didn't feel like, well, this is a good experience. I hope I can do it again. I felt cheated. I felt saddened. 
I felt gypped. And yet in this passage of Scripture, we're going to find out that there are some people, a group of people, who tried to pretend to be a Christian. Tried to, be, try, tried to pretend that they had the power of God in their life when they really didn't have the power of God in their life. And it didn't turn out so well for them. My exhortation, my challenge to you this morning will be this, that one, we must be genuine before the Lord. And then we must live genuinely. There are one of two issues going on. There are probably some here who are pretending to be Christians, saying the right things, doing the right things. But my friends, coming to church, bringing a Bible to church, will no more make you a Christian than sitting in a refrigerator will make you a cucumber. You can sit there all day long, and you'll be a cold person, but you will not be a cucumber. And sitting in church every day, all day, will not make you a Christian. There are some who say Christian things, but don't know Christ right here in their heart. They're not true Christians. I am not, my intent this morning is not make, to, to not make you doubt your salvation, but to challenge you in salvation. And if you're fake, to number one, be genuinely converted, become a Christian. But number two, we'll find this morning there's sometimes there are Christians who all that happens is they just trust Jesus Christ. And then they stifle every, bit of part, every other part in their life. And they think they're pleasing God because of what they're doing. And they're not genuine. So let's look this morning in Scripture, if we could please. Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse number 13. Uh, if you're using the, the Bible in the pew, it's, I think it's page 1,315. We'll begin Acts chapter 19, verse 13. Where well, the Bible says, Then certain of the bag of vagabond Jews exorcists took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? I almost preached a message this morning, do the devils know who you are? Do the devils know who you are? They knew Jesus, and they knew Paul. They didn't know these men. And my friends, when you live for Jesus Christ, it makes a difference. When you're a real Christian, when you're a true Christian, when Christ is in your heart and reflected in your life, it is different. And we wrestle not, the Bible says, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And my friends, when Jesus Christ comes into a life he wants to change a life. He wants that life to reflect. There will always be those who talk the talk and who walk the walk but are not genuine. True Christianity begins with a new spiritual birth. Jesus said this, that a man must be born again. He said that to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, not of a physical birth but of a spiritual birth. And Christianity begins with a new birth on the inside, and it results in a changed life on the outside. I want to live a life, I want to live a life where others know that Jesus Christ lives right here. I want to live a life before the Lord where the demons know that Jesus Christ lives right here. I want them to know this church as a shining light for Jesus Christ. I want them to know that in this church, in this church, we're going to do our best as, as, as humble humans to please Jesus Christ and to be true. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes. I'm going to lead the charge. Your pastor, I'll lead the charge. I will lead the charge in mistakes, but I want to lead the charge in living a life that pleases Jesus Christ. I want to be true. I want to be genuine. So this morning, with God's help, 
We're going to unpack this passage in the next few verses as, as, as well about what it means to be a true Christian. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this time. Lord, as we come before you today, I ask for your help. Lord, I need you. Lord, I've tried to do my part in study, and Lord, I want to reflect in this message your truth. Lord, I'm asking that you would speak through me today. I'm asking that you would take your truth and speak to hearts today. Lord, please, that as we hear from you, that your word would touch us, your spirit would convict us, and by your grace you'd transform us into the image and likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there are those here who don't know you as Savior today, who have never experienced that new birth and believed in Jesus Christ, that today would be the day that they give their life and believe in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for the Christians here this morning. I have no doubt that there are those who have been tempted and tested and tried. And I pray that today you would touch our hearts. Lord, we don't claim to be perfect, but we want to be Christ-like. So Lord, help us. And if you show us an area that we're not pleasing you in, Lord, I pray that you'd give us a grace to humbly repent. You promise to forgive us and you'll restore that relationship. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory this morning. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. As we look at this account, we're going to see, I think, three truths, I believe three truths in this passage that will help us understand what it means, what it looks like to be a true Christian. I wouldn't do this, and we don't have time to do this, but, and I wouldn't, but if I were to ask, have you ever met a fake Christian? Most, if not everyone in this room would say, yes, I have, Pastor. And if I asked for that experience, you would go on to, to share with me a story about an experience you had with someone who professed to be a Christian, who maybe looked the part, who maybe talked the way that you thought a Christian should talk, but then they began to demonstrate by their actions, by their attitude, by their decisions, ways and thoughts and motivations that are contrary to what you believe they should do. Contrary to what you believe the Bible teaches a Christian ought to do and to be and to talk like and act like. It could be in business. Perhaps you've been swindled out of money by a Christian and you think those dirty, rotten Christians, they can't be trusted. Perhaps it was a, a relationship, a coworker, maybe even a family member where you said, I was so poorly treated by someone who claimed to be a Christian. Maybe it was a boss. You see, when we're not true as Christians, when we're not genuine, we hurt the cause of Christ and all those around us. It's not just, I'm in a little island. We have an influence. We have an effect. There are young people who have walked away from Jesus Christ because their parents were fakes. There are churches who don't have members because of pastors who are fakes. And there are lost people who, are not, who have not been saved yet because of Christians who are fake. In this passage, we find a story. Verse number, four, uh, verse number 14. There were seven sons, seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests. And what they did here, they observed something. They observed that there was something supernatural happening. Now, the Scripture tells us that they were exorcists. They went around and they would attempt to cast out demons. But apparently they had observed that when Paul and when a true Christian spoke the name of Jesus, that something different took place. They understood that what they were doing was merely a deceptive practice, but when Jesus Christ got involved, it became the real deal. It became genuine. They observed, that, that, that they observed things that they could not do on their own. And listen, don't miss this, my friends. This is what Jesus Christ brings in all aspects of life. You want real hope? Well, then you come to Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus Christ gets involved, he is the real essence of hope. That's the real deal. All right, and so others can see that. Boy, your hope is different. 
Boy, how can you travel this, this road of despair and others would be discouraged, but you have hope, Jesus Christ. All right, he brings true and genuine uh, emotions and feelings. How can you have this joy, Jesus Christ? No, that's real. And, and, and these seven sons were seeing something different. Isn't that great? I mean, we could equate it here. We see in this church real victory in life. We see real change. Someone who's living one way and Jesus Christ enters and they live a different way. That should be the life of every single Christian, real change. Real hope, real joy, real love, real patience, victory. This is wonderful. So these seven sons, they saw this realness. And they thought, I want that. I want to do something real like that. The only problem was they didn't want to do it the right way. There is a way to have the power of God in your life. It's simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But as many as received him, that has received Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You know how you get the power of God in your life? By simply, humbly coming to Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. But you paid the price for me. You died on the cross for my sins. You were buried and rose again the third day. And by believing in him, trusting in him, there's a new birth that happens and takes place. That's how the power of God comes out of a person's life. It's amazing. Have you been saved this morning? Have you come to Jesus Christ? If so, you have the power of God on your life. Let that sink in for a moment. All right, wake up for me, church. Do you have the power of God in your life this morning? Yeah, we got about 20% power here this morning. Listen, I know, I, I know how we'd have the power of God. If I said, listen, we're done, we have free ribeye steaks. I said, oh, okay, pastor, <laughs> wait, now, no. We have the power of God. It's real. It's real. You can love people for, for real. You have joy for real and hope for real. And these seven sons said, man, that's real, and I want it. But I don't want to get it the right way. And so this is what they did, the Bible tells us. They just said the right things. They just outwardly took the right actions. They said, well, that's where the power is. It's in what you say. And that's like someone saying, well, I'm a Christian, why? Because I said I am. I'm rich, why? Because I said I am. I can fly, because I said I can. Right? I mean, what does that mean? Not much. Not much. You want to see me fly? <laughs> yeah, we want to see you try, Pastor, please. <laughs> Over there, jump up the top part. And they went there, and they tried to claim the power of God with just some outward speech. Notice this. True Christianity is not merely an outward expression of religion. True Christianity is not merely an outward expression of religion. Just because I say I'm a Christian doesn't make me a Christian. Just because I sit in church doesn't make me a Christian. Just because I bring a Bible, I can bring a big Bible, and I got lots of Bibles, that doesn't make me a Christian. I don't have the power of God in my life just because I have an outward expression of religion because I act a certain way and sing some songs. Listen, I, I, could, I could be up here. I'm not. I'm a true Christian, but people could preach from the Bible and not be a true Christian because merely outward expressions doesn't mean that you're genuine and real, and that's what happened with these seven sons. They wanted an outward expression of religion, and it did not end up so well for them. Look in the Scripture, please. Back to your Bibles. Verse number 15, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. How'd it work out for them, good or bad, church? Bad. That's embarrassing. Listen, every time that we try to just have an outward expression without being genuine, it doesn't work out good. Won't work. 
Because Christianity is not merely an outward exercise of religion. In other words, they tried to paint the outside, but stay rotten on the inside. And true Christianity is not merely painting the outside. You know there's an estimated 10,000 physicians who have phony degrees? This is going to rock some of your worlds this morning. You're like, are you kidding? You're going you're to check up on every doctor you ever went to in life. I, I, I found this. I mean, I've not, I've not checked every physician, all right? So don't, don't come and fact check the illustration we found. They said that there was one broker who sold over three years 1.5 million physician degrees. 1.5 million, I'm sorry, 1.5 million dollars worth of physician degrees. And uh, another guy earned, uh, he said, clients paid me 5,000 to 27,000 for my services. What if your physician was a phony, fake? Now some of you this morning are like, I knew it. My doc's a quack. <laughs> I knew it, I could tell. He told me to eat healthy and exercise. He's phony, I know he's phony. I don't like that information. Boy, we would just be aghast, would we not? Would we not tell everybody around us, whoa, don't go to that guy, don't go to that lady. She has a fake degree. But isn't it much worse to profess to be a Christian, to try to act like a Christian and be a fraud, to be a fake? Years ago, the story goes, there was a man, a very rich man, and he wanted to play in an orchestra. Only problem was he couldn't play an instrument. So he paid off the conductor to give him a spot. And apparently the spot he wanted was to be a flautist. I play trombone, so that boggles my mind. If you're going to play something, play something loud, pretend to play something big and loud. But he wanted to play the flute. So the conductor agreed for the right amount of money to sit on the second row of the orchestra. To pull the flute to his lips, but to be sure never to blow any air through the instrument and never play a single note. And that's what he did for two years. Two years later, the conductor left and a new conductor came into town. And now there's a problem. New, the new conductor got up and said that what he needed to do was to hear everyone play so he could properly determine their seats in the orchestra. And this rich man now was about to be exposed. One by one, the orchestra members went before the new conductor and played their instruments. Right before this man's turn, as the story goes, he got a doctor to declare him to be too sick to play. This kept him out of the limelight for a few weeks. But after a couple of weeks, he was healed enough to come back and face the music. Embarrassingly so, with shamefacedness, he had to stand before that conductor and confess that he could not play a single note. My friends, I'm afraid that one day there's some people who will stand before Jesus Christ. And you've been sitting in the orchestra. You've been saying the right things. You've been looking the right, the right way. You've been doing the right things, but you are deceived thinking that Christianity is merely an outward expression of religion, and it's not. Let's see what happens afterwards. The Bible says, the next few verses, verse number 17, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. When they were revealed, everyone found out. They didn't have Facebook back then, they didn't have a news channel. Word travels fast. Everyone found out about these seven boys who tried to fake it till they made it. And they left the house naked and wounded. But the Bible says the response was not that they mocked these men. Because you know what? When someone gets revealed this way, our response should not be to mock them. Right, Christians? We should not sit there saying, aha, I knew it. 
I knew that guy was a fake. I could just smell it. I could smell it on him. I could, I could. Oh, I knew that girl. She was never real anyway. One time I came to church and, and she rolled her eyes at me. I knew she was fake. I knew it. I, I knew that Mary was having trouble. Why? Because one time they were driving up and I saw they were looking the outside either windows. They were fighting all the way to church. I knew it. Boy, how quick we are to judge, aren't we? What happens here is that fear fell on them and, and I love this, look at the last phrase, and the name of the Lord was magnified. You know what true Christianity does? True Christianity magnifies Jesus Christ. True Christianity magnifies Jesus Christ. I, everyone heard about it, but Jesus Christ was magnified. Jesus Christ was uplifted. They, they, they said here in the next verse, that in verse number 18, that many believed, came, and confessed, and showed their deeds. You know what happened? Jesus Christ, his power was magnified. His power was magnified. His sacrifice was magnified, and his work was magnified. Jesus Christ was magnified. When Christians are true and genuine, Jesus Christ is uplifted. That is our purpose. That is the goal of this church, hopefully of your life and my life, to not magnify J.D. Howell or to magnify yourself or your success or your job, but to merely uplift Jesus Christ. And if someone stumbles and falls, we don't point and laugh and ridicule. We uplift Jesus Christ. And if someone succeeds more than we do, we uplift Jesus Christ. And if someone who is not genuine becomes genuine, we uplift Jesus Christ. What would our churches look like if Christians began to magnify Jesus Christ? If you came to church saying, listen, my job today is to uplift Jesus Christ. And when we sing, I'm going to sing to the glory of God. And I love how this church sings, old and young, those who've been saved a little while, those who've been saved a long time. You lift up your voices in praise to Jesus Christ. I love how this church fellowships and keep fellowshipping. Encourage each other. Let people know that you're glad they're here. All right, well, I don't know them, pastor. Meet them. Uplift Jesus Christ. I love how this church prays for each other. Uplift and magnify Jesus Christ. Is this church perfect? No, because you have an imperfect pastor. But we have a perfect Savior who deserves the glory, who deserves the praise in your life. When you go to work, magnify Jesus Christ. When you drive, magnify Jesus Christ. When you go to the bank, magnify Jesus Christ. When you go to Starbucks, magnify Jesus Christ. True Christianity magnifies Jesus Christ. Who are you magnifying in your life? Those seven boys tried to magnify themselves. But instead, Christ was magnified. But the story doesn't stop there. It could stop there. We could stop it right there. We could have an invitation, and we all ought to respond. Because if we're honest, we don't always magnify Jesus Christ. But Luke, under inspiration of God, gives us just a couple more amazing details. Look in Scripture. I love this last part, what happens here. Verse number 19. Many of them, these are those who just got saved, those who confessed Jesus Christ, those who are magnifying Jesus Christ, many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Let me tell you what happens when when you have genuine and true Christians. It magnifies Jesus Christ. And here's the last thought. True Christianity will be displayed through outward expressions. And Luke doesn't stop there. He says this is how it was displayed. He said there were some of those, those people, some of those men, some of those women, who dealt in, in perceived magic, curious arts. They had a book of incantations. Or, if I can put it this way, they were living a life in rebellion to Jesus Christ. They were living a life in direct opposition to God and his power and his sacrifice and his character. And because Christ was magnified, they confessed Jesus, repented of their deeds, and now they have some things in their life that displeased God. 
When you get saved, God is going to reveal some things in your life that displease him. That's just the way it is because there is no one who is perfect. He's going to reveal some attitudes that displease him. He's going to reveal some choices that displease him. He may reveal some habits and addictions that displease him. And for these Christians, it was their curious arts, these books. So this is what they did. Now, some may wonder, Pastor, why do you have people come forward an invitation to pray? Part of the reason comes from this passage right here. Because when Christ does something here, it ought to be displayed out here. Now, I know we can make decisions, and we ought to all the time for Jesus Christ. Driving down the road, personal, personal time in, in your devotions, and, and inwardly. But there are times, there are times that we must display outwardly what Christ did inwardly. All right? And this happened right here. So they took these books. You look in the Bible. And they burned them before, look at the scripture, before who? What does the Bible say? Look at it. Before who? Look at it. What does it say? All men. That means everybody. So this was not a private burning. This was not in someone's backyard. This was not in their garage. All right? One of these guys, one of these girls said, listen, I've got these books. I'm done. I'm a real Christian. Jesus Christ did something right here. I believe in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm different now. And I realize that these things in my life are a complete and utter rebellion to Jesus Christ. And I'm done with them. And so, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get rid of them in front of everybody. And I'm going to burn them. I'm going to burn them. And someone else said, that's a good idea. I'm going to burn mine too. Someone had the first idea. It just takes one. And they piled up these books. But the Bible says something, and I love the detail the Bible gives us. Do you see the worth of these books? And the price of them was 50,000 pieces of silver. You see that in the Bible? What person, if I can, what fool was adding up what these books were worth? Because someone was. Someone was like, well, that book was 100 bucks. That book's worth 200 bucks. That book was worth 300 bucks. Now, let me translate that, that price into our current economy. Between 5.5 million and 1.5 billion dollars. And the question that we don't know is if they're referring to a day's wage denarius or to denarius or what piece of silver they're referring to. It could be either one. Either way, 5.5 million or 1.5 billion, it's more than 10 bucks. That means when they had this pile of books, that it was, it was an occasion. Those crazy Christians are burning money over there. You could sell those things and, and then give it to the church. No, sir. No, sir. What Christ did right here, you're going to see it right here. $200. And this young man walks up. Everyone knows he's lived a pagan life. He's got a big stack of them. Walks to that big old bonfire. Maybe he thinks for a moment. Man, this is $100,000. $100,000. Boy, I could support Paul on the mission field with this. I could help that church in Thessalonica with this. But he knows that what happened right here is real. He walks over, turns away from those books, says, I'm done. You see, true Christianity results in outward expression. You know, we have Christians who want to hide their transformation. They don't even want to tell a coworker about Jesus Christ. And here in Acts, we have people burning millions of dollars worth of books just to show that they're true Christians. Christianity was not made to be a silent transformation. It's not made that way. Christ didn't save you to be quiet about what God did in your life. He saved you to, to burn the books. Some want to be a hidden transformation. Oh, they don't find out I'm a Christian. 
Hope they don't find out that I, that I go to that church. They may think I'm weird. Listen, you start burning some books, they're going to think you're weird. I promise you, so you burn some books, they're going to think you're weird. You don't let your kids do that? No, why not? I'm a Christian. And when I became a Christian, I realized there's some things in my life and for my kids that don't please Jesus Christ. So you know what? I'm burning them. I'm burning them. It's a beautiful day. Go play golf this morning. I'm going to church. Why are you going to church on this Sunday morning? Because I burned my golf game. I burned my golf game for Jesus Christ. Because what he did right here, what he did right here has got to be out here. And Christianity was never meant to be a tiny transformation. It wasn't meant to be tiny. It wasn't meant to be small. You pile on some books, that's a big deal. You see, when Jesus Christ saves us, it's a new birth. And he wants to do something powerful in your life. And our practice, what we do, must mimic, must echo our profession. And so this morning, the challenge, the question, are you, are you a true Christian? Have you been transformed by the power of God? Do you know that you've put yourself aside, that you've leaned and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? If not, today, when we go to invitation, let us open the Bible and show you from the Word of God how you can be saved. That's the beginning. If you're not saved this morning, my friend, you're not genuine, you're not real. Only two types of people, those who are saved and those who are not saved. And the first question, the first call is simple, that if you're not saved, to come to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. No one who has ever come to Jesus Christ has ever been turned away. I don't care how bad you think you are. I don't care what your background is or, what you, or anything. Jesus Christ will receive you. Someone who comes to Jesus Christ for salvation will receive it every time. The second question, for those who have settled that eternal question, is are you a true Christian? What happens here, Christian, must be displayed out here. Someone said that some church's problem is that they give people the misconception that we can add Christ to our lives but not subtract anything. When Jesus Christ moves in, if I can, he's going to show that there are things that don't please him. So if I can, figuratively speaking, throw it on the bonfire. No matter the cost, throw it on the bonfire. There's some, there's some Christians who claim the name of Jesus Christ who are looking for loopholes. Well, pastor, is the, is the Bible really sure about this? And I could insert any hundred of ideas of, of self-justifications. From coming to church, to raising children, to drinking alcohol, to living together in fornication, any, any sort of thing. And, and they're looking for loopholes. When Jesus Christ moves in, he wants to make a change. Al Johnson was a Kansas man man from Kansas, came to Jesus Christ. When he got saved, he got genuinely saved. And Christ did something here. In his past, there was a big mistake. He had robbed a bank. Never convicted, never caught. It was a cold case. But when he got saved, it was real. It was genuine. Something happened. And he knew in his heart that what he had done was against God. What would you do? What would you do, what would you do if you got saved and you knew in your past you were a bank robber? Some would ignore it. 
thought some would burn it. Went down to the police station. And he said, 19 years earlier, I'm sorry, a little bit longer than 19. He was 19 when it happened. He said, years earlier, I robbed this bank. Now you want to know what happened, don't you? Did he go to jail? I'll tell you what happened. He had an outward display of an inward transformation. That's what happened. That he lived what he believed. That's what happened. That's what happened. Now, legally, that's what you want to know. Legally, the statute of limitations had run out. He never spent a day in jail. Now, don't you feel better already? <sighs> but you know what? That's not what's important, though. And that's where, we get, that's where we get misguided. We think that part's important. Did he pay for it? Did he not pay for it? Oh, I'm so glad the story had a good ending. No, what's important was that what happened here did something out here. And my friends, if you're not a Christian, then today, we have invitations, slip out of your seat. Well, if someone meets you, a man and a woman, open the Bible and show you from the Word of God how to be a true Christian. And if you are a Christian, make sure that you're a true Christian. That what has happened here comes out here. 